Thanks. Uh, I guess this is working. All right. Thanks for this great uh, conference and for, for inviting me. Um, I'm going to take a slightly different aspect to the idea of um, wave functions and machine learning, wave functions and machine learning than the previous speaker. But uh, I, nevertheless, I think a, a valuable approach. So my interest to machine learning is related to the applications that we're interested in. So in my group, we're quite interested in what I sometimes like to call extreme chemistry, in the sense that we, we like to push manip manipulation and control of molecules to the single molecule level, so exposing molecules to extreme forces, but also extreme light matter interaction uh, to drive chemical reactions. And uh, particularly, you know, as Roland said, in chemistry, we're interested in making and breaking bonds. And so that's where things get complicated, typically. Just give, let me give you an example of how extreme chemistry could look like, an example that everybody will be able to relate to. So if we talk about exposing molecules to extreme conditions, we talk about strong magnetic field, intense radiation, extreme pressures and temperatures. And the best example for this is the example of prebiotic chemical evolution of nuclear bases in what I call natural molecular forges. So you have to imagine billions of years ago on Earth, right? There's no ozone layer. There's, there's not much happening except these primordial puddles where there's either extraterrestrial infall or material through volcanic activity. And you have extreme intense UV radiation that constantly churns through this material. So that basically makes and breaks molecules and that have to be able to survive under these extreme conditions and out come molecules that have certain photostability properties that make them survive in this environment. And these molecules, of course, we know now as nucleobases. And as part of this prebiotic evolution, they've been designed through this process to have very efficient uh, photodecay mechanisms. So these molecules are very, very good. If, if they do manage to get excited by a UV photon, they're very good at taking this electronic energy and quickly transferring it into vibrational energy. So it's just a quick wiggle and a jiggle and the molecule is suddenly transferred into vibrational energy. And on top of this, there's a second evolutionary process where at some point, of course, the great oxygenation event created the, the ozone layer. And so most of these molecules now have their maximum absorption exactly where the ozone layer sits. So on top of being very good at getting rid of, of UV light, they also happen to have excitations in a range where they don't get a lot of UV light that is, that, that is dangerous. So this is really, really interesting. I really like this because it means there was a process that led to a really property-driven molecular design of these optoelectronic properties. And I'm, I'm wondering, can we create computational simulation frameworks that allow us to do similar things uh, artificially? And so the way how we try to approach the problem of studying quantum dynamics uh, in, these, in complex materials is we have to combine electronic structure theory for uh, molecule metal interfaces. Typically, it's the problems that we're interested in, particularly looking at excited states. We have to study ways how to combine, the, how to propagate the coupled electronuclear dynamics. So how do electronic excitations affect the dynamics of molecules? And we have to study how light actually leads to the excitation of electrons. So all of these three things alone can keep you busy for a couple of decades. And the magic glue by which we hold it together is what I call machine learning of electronic structure. So we try to construct surrogate models of the electronic structure that it, uh, for the quantities that we need to propagate large-scale dynamics. So that includes excited states, couplings, response properties, et cetera, et cetera. So we try to go specifically beyond energy landscapes here. Uh, so the idea is, you know, you have some type of model of the electronic structure that gives you the ability to study different properties as a function of time. And using that, you can propagate it with non hermetic dynamics methods, ways how to simulate light matter interaction, such that we have a combined approach that allows us to really look at the immediate transfer of energy from light to electrons to nuclei. So that's, that's sort of the, the grand vision. Uh, and machine learning plays an important role in this. So, so what is the role of machine learning in quantum chemistry? I would argue, you know, if you want to extremely simplify things, you could argue there are two big problems in quantum chemistry. The one big problem, and I heavily simplify to the point that is wrong, is if you do accurate quantum chemistry, it's typically very slow, and if you do fast quantum chemistry, it's typically very inaccurate. 
which is uh, the graphical expression is this diagonal line. You always see plots where different methods are plotted on a diagonal line. So machine learning gives us the ability to accelerate property prediction by parametrization, right? So that's great. Um, the more interesting aspect, in my opinion, is the idea that um, the structure property paradigm means that you know you cannot run a quantum chemistry calculation if you don't have an X, Y, Z geometry. You gotta know roughly where the atoms sit to get started and what atoms sit where. And the problem is, of course, chemical compound space is very big. And it's not just about the size, it's also about the metric of that space and the dimensionality. We don't know what good distances are in this high dimensional space. So we don't actually know how close we are from various compounds we may or may not have ever discovered. Um, and, and that is a, a problem that is conceptually a lot harder, where machine learning can really help us to accelerate materials prediction, materials design, and maybe invert this structure property dilemma that we have, uh, particularly in quantum chemistry. And if you think about, I, I think the impact of machine learning in quantum chemistry must be judged by how these new methods that are being developed impact the day-to-day -day life of a PhD student nowadays. And if you think about the, the, the daily grind of a PhD student in, in quantum chemistry, you'll, you'll see a pipeline of things they constantly have to worry about. So they have to think about how do I model my system, how many atoms do I include, which atoms do I include, at which level of theory. How do I do my electronic structure calculation at which level structure optimization dynamics? And at the end, whatever I get out, I need to relate to experiment. And at all of these different stages, there are various different techniques that have been developed in the last few years where we see that really help the daily life of a student. And now we're getting, and we've seen lots of great works where people show in proof of principle what is possible. But, and you know, you might get a bit upset by this opinion, I don't yet see the fundamental shift where we, we, we have software frameworks that really change, that affect quantum chemists, uh, the majority of quantum chemists on a daily basis. And I think for this to happen, we need to really rethink how software in quantum chemistry works. And over the last few decades, we've seen the you know, long-standing packages being developed as monolithic blocks with an input and an output, and there's lots of in, in, magic happening in the middle. But what we need, if we want to really use machine learning effectively in this field, we need modular software frameworks that allow us at every single stage in the process to extract data and to feed data back in. So I think that the, the paradigm by which we develop software really has to change. And we've seen a lot of software packages going into this direction. So that, you know, you might have an extremely effective integral engine and you're going to use that to extract data in machine learning. You have separate packages that do dynamics. Everything can be mixed with everything. Everything's connected to the cloud for data. This, this is, I think, the direction we need to be heading if we want to make good use of machine learning, quote unquote, under the hood in quantum chemistry. Because that's how you have impact when people don't even know that they're using it. Arguably, and this is to me a bit upsetting, the machine learning technology that currently has the greatest day-to-day -day impact on PhD students is of course ChatGPT, right? So if I ask ChatGPT to, to generate an input file for Gaussian to do a certain thing, it'll do that and it's not even wrong, right? So it, in fact, you can do this for most software packages now. It helps you to get started with things. I can even ask it to give me the input coordinates of benzene and that also comes out nicely. So it makes, you know, it, it actually is a really helpful technology that speeds up things. Of course, you have to be careful, right? So if I ask it to give me the coordinates of azobenzene, you know, so it, you still need to be able to check if, if what you're getting is sensible. So this is a bit of a weird version of azobenzene, not that the one that I remember. So, so when we now are at a stage where we quite confidently can parametrize uh, machine learning models to quantum mechanics data. So we, we have outputs from quantum chemistry, energy landscapes, dipole moments, et cetera, et cetera. And we can map the positions and elemental composition onto these properties. We can also, one thing that we, we try to think about is, can we take some of the engine, the operational things in quantum chemistry and make machine learning models early on in this pipeline so that, for example, we construct a machine learning model of wave functions and Hamiltonians, and then we use the, uh, what we know about quantum mechanics, how to evaluate expectation values, et cetera, et cetera, on those models 
to then get properties up. And with this idea in mind, back, back in the olden days of 2019, we developed this uh, machine learning model for orbitals, where we basically parameterize uh, a Hamiltonian local atomic orbit representation. So in the same representation that all quantum chemistry, most quantum chemistry codes use as a function of coordinates and positions of a molecule. That gives us a Hamiltonian, which we can diagonalize, we get energy levels, and we get wave functions, which we can plot, right? And so the model is big and it's complicated, and we've learned a lot about uh, that recently that it doesn't actually have to be that complicated. I don't need you, you know, don't worry about all the details here. I'll walk you through some of the key aspects. So with most ato atomistic machine learning, we have atomic embeddings, and for each atom in the system, we have some type of feature that we're propagating through this whole network where there's lots of stuff happening. So for each atom, there's a, a feature X. And as we, as in interatomic potentials, we have to train the model to understand the local environment of the atom and how that affects its local energy and local properties. And then at the end, we can get a sum of, the sum of these properties would be the energy. In addition, what we have to add here now is a way to create pairwise features. So we have to make some tensor contractions of atomic features because of course in a Hamiltonian, I have interactions of orbitals within a block on, on that atom, but I also have interactions across atoms. So I need to have features that they, they tell me about what's happening between atoms. And that's what's, what's going on here. Then we construct a polynomial basis from these features, pairwise and otherwise, and we can construct the individual blocks of that Hamiltonian in that way. So that's basically what this says. And the one thing you need to remember is that all of this falls apart if you forget this bit here. So instead of just looking at all the possible distances in the system, we have to look at directional distance vectors. And the reason for that is, of course, that orbitals, atomic orbitals, have a phase. So it matters if my p orbitals look like this or like this, because if I don't include the actual sign that relates them orientationally, I cannot describe the way how two s orbitals split up into a sigma and sigma star when they come together. So it really, really doesn't work. Um, if you train this model on hartree fock DFD data, mean field Hamiltonians in this local orbital representation, you can see you can represent the orbitals. And if you rotate the Hamiltonians, you basically have to, we, what we did back then is we did data augmentation. So we had to train the model to understand these rotations so that it also rotates the orbitals properly with the model. Now, by now we know that if you properly encode those rotational transformation properties, which we know, of course, as Wigner matrices that tell us exactly how the Hamiltonians rotate, we can get to equivariant models that automatically know what happens to the Hamiltonian if you rigidly rotate a system. And there's a couple of different efforts that have achieved this. Um, so that model was able to give you meaningful performance for these orbital energies and wave functions, and in fact, we can you know, very quickly now predict orbital energies, wave function coefficients, et cetera, et cetera, through dynamics. Why is that interesting? You know, who needs that? There's a couple of interesting aspects to this. If you train a model to understand the basis representation in the language of quantum chemistry, that means you can also feed that straight back into quantum chemistry codes. So we can take these machine learned wave functions and Hamiltonians and density matrices, and we can feed them straight back into quantum mechanics, for example, to initialize calculations or to calculate post hartree fock correlation energies based on them, or um, to on the fly learn density matrices, which is what we're currently uh, trying to make work in FHA Ames, where we basically try to just not throw away data on the fly and use better guesses for density matrices in our calculations. So this is an example of how you can then use this stuff under the hood in quantum mechanics codes, such that the user doesn't necessarily even have to know about it. The more interesting aspect is, as always, we create an analytical representation of whatever quantity we've, we've, we've fitted. So that means we have access to all possible derivatives. And that means we also have access to expectation values of the wave function and the Hamiltonian. And we can ask interesting questions. So we can ask questions like, give me the structure that will minimize or maximize a certain electronic property. So if I think about the homo-lumo gap of this molecule, I can calculate exactly the gradient that will point to the structural change that maximizes or minimizes it. So if I stretch this bond, I maximize it. If I stretch this bond, I minimize it. And you'll see in a minute a good application that pushes this to the next level. 
So there are lots, you know, four years is a long time in machine learning land. So everything I just told you is now completely irrelevant. <laughs> it's completely superseded with better models. And uh, so the original problems of the Schnorr model were that we, it was not rotationally equivariant, so it didn't correctly capture these rotational symmetries, and there's been lots of great efforts recently, in, including by us, to, to fix that. The other problem was that uh, it wasn't really transferable. So because we need to construct the local basis representation, that basis, the size of that matrix differs if you look at different molecules. So the model wasn't really able to handle that. So we've also fixed that now. And the, the rotational equivariance issue was a problem that when you went to larger molecules, you, you just cannot fix this issue with data augmentation. So if you go from this melondial that had to aspirin, you literally get a headache from the, all the errors that you end up getting in the model. Uh, so the transferability issue is something we've addressed recently. And we can now also predict these Hamiltonians for the condensed phase. So let me show you some of these efforts. So the first, I'll, I'll first talk about problem one and problem three, which we can address at the same time. So once you figured out that a Hamiltonian in local orbital representation is just composed of many different blocks between pairs of atoms, each atom has its atomic orbitals, and each of these atoms has a certain set of angular momentum components which form their own separate blocks. And we know all of their transformation properties because they're in all the old te textbooks, right? So I know that if I apply a Wigner rotation matrix to, this, to one of these blocks, I know exactly how it transforms. And so I can basically create a data pipeline where I construct these Hamiltonians from your personal favorite quantum chemistry code then I construct a basis representation where I do exactly what I just showed you, but I do it in a much more efficient way. So I construct a local basis representation that captures the chemical environment of the atom. Then I construct this polynomial basis that captures you know, all possible variations in radial and uh, angular components. And then I symmetrize it such that it understands these rotational equivalence properties. So that means that if I have this basis, I need to know that this basis transforms correctly according to rotational properties. So for, you, know, you might remember David's talk yesterday. This is kind of a generalization of the slater costa transformation for diatomic molecules. This is a universal version of that for arbitrary structures. So we have to account for all of the symmetries. And at the end of the day, we get a model that is a set of matrices that depend on the coordinates of the atoms times vectors. And these vectors are what we need to fit. So we have a linear algebra problem, vector times matrix, and we can solve it with a linear least squares fit. So this model here gives us an accurate representation of the Hamiltonian and overlap matrices in this basis, and it does it with a linear least squares fit. So how does this work? If we look at aluminum, uh, we can plot the band structure of bulk aluminum in the model and DFD, and they agree very nicely. We can do this for FCC and BCC. You can train these model on models on very, very little data. In fact, we can train it just on BCC data, and we can predict FCC and vice versa. They generalize very well, because every single structure has thousands and thousands of integrals, all of which capture various different distances. Um, and because we have a systematically constructed basis, we can increase the polynomial degree, the variational flexibility of the basis, to improve the fit systematically. So problem one and problem two solved. When you, once you have this, you can think about interoperability in software. So we're now trying to think about pipelines, data pipelines, where we can connect bridge first and second principles, semi-empirical models. So I have DFT calculation from which I can construct these semi-empirical, these, these really accurate machine learned Hamiltonians. I feed them into semi-empirical codes, which give me a whole infrastructure of various different things, transport properties that can be calculated. And so we're really trying to sh shuffle data between different codes that weren't able to talk to each other previously. And this, this is where, for me, it gets interesting because that really creates new capabilities. And it also allows us to reuse code. Not every single code has to reinvent the same thing over and over again. So those two problems sorted. The transferability problem is an interesting, different one. So this is something I did together with a really great postdoc who's now Julia now moved on to a, an assistant professorship position in Leipzig. And here the idea was, can we come up with a machine learning model for, for the eigenstates of a system 
that works for various different molecules. So now the idea was we've got a deep learning pipeline. And in this case, we construct a Hamiltonian at the end of it in this message passing model. And when we diagonalize that Hamiltonian, it gives us the eigen energies of the system. So it predicts n electronic energy levels. The thing is, we don't actually define what this Hamiltonian is. We don't define the basis. Previously, we've used local atomic orbital basis. Now I'm going to say, I don't care. It's just a random Hamiltonian. The only thing I enforce is that when I diagonalize it, it has to give me the eigenvalues. I don't actually care what the basis is. And it's also got a fixed size. So if we train this model on various, uh, so it turns out if you train a model on just this vector, you get rid of this, you get very noisy training on energy levels. Uh, so it's not very accurate. If you add this Hamiltonian, magically, you get a really accurate fit of energies over a wide range of energies. So it does something that improves things. And you'll see in a minute why that is. So now we take this model and we train it on a massive database of crystal forming organic molecules. So this OE62 database has hybrid DFT level data. It has a small subset. So this is 62,000 data points for chemically very diverse molecules. It has a small subset of many body perturbation theory data, which is great because these are very accurate electron addition and removal energies. So they really relate to photo emission, inverse photo emission data. And when we learn the model, this is a correlation plot across all possible energy levels, uh, across all possible molecules. Um, looks noisy, but it's on the diagonal, which is good. There's quite, quite a few outliers for big wonky molecules that you don't see a lot in, in nature, but we do get a fit. So we can basically predict the conjum energy levels from DFT with this model. So why does it work? And it's helpful to think about what adiabatic energy levels are. If you look at the eigenvalues, the conjum states of a, Hamilton, of, of a system as a function of its coordinates, these are not smooth functions, right? They have cusps and they have weird behavior. They, they're not allowed to cross. And smooth parametrization with a universal approximator is not good at fitting non-smooth functions. So what this fake Hamiltonian does, it creates quote unquote diabetic representations of states that actually are allowed to cross and that are a lot smoother. So we don't necessarily know what these representations mean because I didn't define the basis but they help to fit, and I only care about these orbital energies. In fact, I can also plot this across composition space. So I can plot these diabetic states across changing molecules. I don't know what it means, but you can plot it. Um, so I've got these energy levels, but they're not really interesting because they're conjum energy levels and they don't mean anything, except for the home. So now I'll take this many body perturbation theory data and I do delta machine learning which basically means I take a smaller set of data and I try to learn the relationship, the difference between DFT and many body perturbation theory, which is a very consistent relationship that's smooth and much easier to learn. And now I, you can see we, we open up the band gap here. So this is now the fundamental gap. These are the unoccupied states. These are the occupied states. So that we capture correctly. And in fact, the model prediction gets better. So now, by combining those two, we have a model where for the whole set of these molecules, we can predict energy levels at the GW level. And now I can look at out-of-distribution molecules, so molecules that are really far away from what the model has seen. These azulines is something that are not, not even close to, similar to what's in the data set, and these types of structures. And we can see that the model prediction is reasonably close to uh, photo emission spectra. So that's nice. That means for, I can now basically predict for various different organic molecules photo emission and inverse photo emission spectra. I can also use this approach to look at XPS if I wanted to do. And at no point during this prediction do I need to do a DFT calculation or a semi empirical calculation or anything. It's just all. So I can basically predict a couple of hundred thousand molecules in a day. And that brings me back to this idea of the natural molecular forage. Because now I've got something that allows me to very quickly screen through different properties. And we can think about an artificial version of this, where um, what I need is something that constantly creates new molecules, something that generates molecules, and something that probes molecules, that checks if the properties of the molecules are right. Um, and those two molecules need to keep, those two models need to talk to each other such that we can identify the best possible molecules with specific properties. And so we've tried to do this 
in the context of organic uh, electronics, where of course in organic light emitting diodes, you have thin films of molecules that need very specific electronic properties. They need to have the right electron affinities, ionization potentials in the right cascade so you can transport holes in the electrons uh, to the right place so they recombine and emit blue light or green light or whatever laser pointer you need. And so how does this work? The first thing, so we've, in the, on the previous slide I showed you this. So we have a predictive model that gives me the properties. So I'm missing this, I need this generative model. And the way how we do this is with this generative Schnett or G Schnett model which is a model that basically predicts uh, the probability of 3D point clouds. Um, it, this looks very complicated. The two things you need to look at is this equation and this equation. So what the model actually trains, uh, learns, is the conditional probability of finding a certain element in the vicinity of another element. And it learns the conditional probability of finding it at a certain distance, at a certain angle, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's what the, what the model is trained on. And then the model uses this to heuristically build new molecules. It says, what's the most likely next atom to be found to carbon? It's oxygen. OK, what's the most likely next position? It'll be somewhere around this arc. And it has heuristic rules to build new molecules and heuristic rules to truncate these molecules when it's done. So if you train this model on OE62, uh, we see that it, in, we generate 100,000 new molecules that are unseen. We see that the elemental composition of those generated molecules are similar to the original database. So that's good. So the model has captured the correct elemental distribution of the underlying data set. What we also see is for those 100,000 molecules, we then predict the fundamental gap, the ionization potential and the electron affinity, and they also lie in the same range as those quantities for the original data set. So the model is able to predict the right composition and those molecules that are predicted have the right properties. So that's great. Um, and now what we want to do is we want to find new molecules with new properties. So how do we do that? Uh, so we basically make a loop where we take the generative model and we ask it to churn out tons of molecules. So give me 50,000 new molecules. We check for the obviously silly ones that are disconnected or so and we throw those out. Surprisingly very few end up like that. Then we screen those molecules for the electronic properties in question. And we filter them out and we retrain the model such that it preferentially gives us molecules with those properties. So if you look at this plot, you can see this is the distribution of fundamental gaps of ionization, difference between ionization potential and electron affinity for 50,000 molecules we predict with the original model. Then we take 10% with the lowest fundamental gap and we retrain. So we make a new prediction. Now the distribution has shifted. And we do it again and again and again and again. And every time we do it, we basically bias the model to give us more and more molecules with lower and lower fundamental gaps to the point that we now have a distribution that is outside of the original distribution of properties that we had. And so initially, I found that a bit worrying because it means, oh, so the model's now extrapolating. You don't know what it's predicting. At every step, of course, we take a few data points and we redo the GW calculation to check that our predictive model is still valid in that regime. So it remains in distribution for the properties. It turns out if you plot the structural space approximately, approximately for the data set, we're not really leaving that space, we're just zooming in. We're basically just looking at parts where those properties differ. Uh, of, but the problem is, of course, if we only train on electronic properties, we end up getting somewhat silly molecules at the end, right? Because we haven't really told the model about synthetic viability, which you've heard from Bossio Mercado's talk. So what we do is we take a, a metric that tells us how synthetically viable molecules are, we go back, and now we retrain on two properties. So we try to find the Pareto optimal solution of things that have low fundamental gaps and are synthetically viable, at least assuming from the Sigma Eldridge catalog. And the result are actually reasonable molecules that you can find in existing older technology. So let me skip this last part, some of the new things we're doing on terahertz, optim terahertz design. Um, so I hope I could convince you that there is progress in using these surrogate models to do things that we could otherwise not do and to really change the way how we bring software into the 21st century. I guess it's been a while since we came into the 21st century. Maybe we need to start thinking about the 22nd. 
Uh, there's lots of different things we still have to do. It's nice to think about models that don't rely on defined basis sets. So what we previously heard from the previous speaker is end-to-end -end learning. And I think this idea of the artificial molecular forges is the way forward. Thanks. Thanks for the very interesting talk. Um, you mentioned that when you iteratively train the generative model, you essentially uh, shift the predicted distribution by shifting the training distribution. Um, have you considered using conditional generative uh, models to maybe capture the entire range of... of uh, so there studies. is a version of Chishnet that does conditional training, so where you basically, in addition to learning on the structures, you also learn labels to these structures. And then, of course, it's very easy to bisect that distribution space to say, give me all structures with labels here and there. And we, we've now started comparing those two. So are there benefits to using the conditional model versus like biasing retraining models? And there are some cases where the conditional model, of course, is, is much, much better because you're not reducing the space into which you look. You're not constantly retraining in more narrow, narrow spaces. There are also, but what we see is that the biasing actually gets us into more interesting places that are further away from the distribution. Okay. Um, so I'm, I, I haven't yet figured out how you could combine the two where you, for example, you do conditional learning, but you don't need labels for all of the training data. That would be, I think, the way to go, because then you have both. Because very often for our data, we don't have labels. Mm. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for the impressive talk. I was wondering, in the Schnorb part, you, you showed that you can derive uh, the, you can learn the orbitals and orbital energies. But can you get the total energy? Uh, so, in, the usual rules apply. The total energy in Hartree Fock and DFD is not the sum of the, eigen sure. energy, of the eigenvalue energies. So, we're missing a contribution. But, for example, what we can do is we, we can just learn, on, learn a potential on the difference between the total energy and the, uh, the, the one electron Hamiltonian trace. And that's kind of like in DFDB, the repulsive energy. Okay. And, and that actually is a very smooth potential. It's very easy to learn. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>